Hello everybody, welcome to uh, September Auslearn chat. I'm Conto Titus from Learn Coach Consulting and the convener of Auslearn. Today we're very fortunate enough to have with us, uh, all the way from uh, the United States, uh, the, one of the L&D gurus, you've probably heard of him, seen him around, read his blog, uh, Clark Quinn. So welcome Clark, and if you can tell us uh, where you are today and a bit about your background. Um, sure, um, and I appreciate the opportunity. So um, I'm in uh, California right now. Um, I moved back after uh, my sojourn uh, overseas. I saw the connection between computers and learning as an undergraduate, and I hate to tell you how long ago that was. Uh, and uh, it's ended up being my career. I designed my major, designed and programmed education computer games, went back to get a PhD in applied cognitive science, uh, because I really wanted to understand how we learn and think so we can design systems that align with that. Um, ended up teaching at Uni New South Wales uh, for se seven years and joined uh, OpenNet and then Access Australia Cooperative Multimedia Center before I came back to the U.S. Uh, for family reasons. I could easily have stayed there. Um, and But most of my career and subsequently the decade of consulting I've done up till now, um, since then, has been helping organizations use technology in ways that match how we think, work, and learn. And uh, that's included everything from games to mobile to adaptive systems to content models and engineering. But it's always been at the sort of cutting edge of where technology has gone. And I've been very fortunate to play with some of the really cool stuff as they've come out over the decades. <laughs> and, um, uh, but that's what I do. And, and coming from a deep passion for learning and a you know, geek's fascination with the technology, what's driven me has has been looking at what could be done and what is being done and trying to help bridge the gap, which obviously leads us to the topic at hand. Thank you, Clark. That's great. Um, yes, Clark recently brought out his uh, book, and hopefully most of you got it. We'll have a link uh, on the um, on the side to Clark's new book, Revolutionize Learning and Development. And as you can see, I'm about halfway through with Clark and everyone else, so I'm getting there. So I thought a good opportunity to talk to Clark about what are some of the uh, the trends, I suppose, and more importantly, the challenges that L&D professionals around the world are facing. And within the book, Clark has made some comments about some of the things that um, I suppose he's seen has been um, where we're at and where we need to, to move and change and, and challenge ourselves. So Clark, what do you think some of the challenges that L&D professionals face uh, in this new world? Um, the challenges I see people facing are passionate, you know, instructional designers who care about good learning, but in, for a wide variety of reasons, they end up being constrained to producing, you know, using rapid learning tools to produce a content dump and a knowledge test. And th their, you know, their reasons include, you know, we're trying to do it efficiently. We don't know any better. Somebody's came and asked for a course. We have a bunch of PDFs and PowerPoints. And we're just going to convert them the easiest way we can. We're trying to do scale. The problem is, is none of that works. Knowledge dump and knowledge test and cognitive science, we say it leads to what we call inert knowledge. You will pass, you know, study it and pass a test on it. You go out in the real world where it's relevant and you won't even be activated. And we need to do better. And we can do better. We know what leads to effective learning, but it is not one-shot event-based learning of get a bunch of information, click to learn more, take a test, because that dissipates really quickly. And you know, first of all, you can't remember most of it anyways, and, and three days later, you re remember essentially none of it. And it isn't actionable. So we can do better. You look at the statistics. Um, we're measuring the wrong things. We measure how long people spend in seats and how much it costs per time in seat instead of any impact on the business. Um, when you ask people whether they're actually helping the business, the answer is no, less than 35% believe that they're actually having a meaningful impact on the business. It, the, the litany goes on and on. There's a lot of reasons why, but the real issue is not to, you know, we need a little slap upside the head to shake us out of complacency, but we really want to focus on how we move forward, what it looks like moving forward and how we get there from where we are. Yep, that's great. That's true, and that's something we all are, are facing. You're right about the the way we measure learning. I think uh, that's the biggest um, struggle we all have, and having done a bit of that in my previous life, I think it's always the challenge before us is to 
prove, if not prove, uh, determine some value add that LMDs had on the, the business. And I, I always recall one of the conversations I had with my senior exec was, that's great, Con. We know how much time we're spending in the classroom. We know how many bums on seats we've had. But so what? And I've, never, I've always used that so what as a powerful metaphor about so what? What difference did it make? You know, what did I get out of it? What did the business get out of it? So I think you're right. So on that on that sort of concept there, Clark, I want to pick up a bit there about the evaluation and measurements. Uh, you, you sort of made reference to some of the uh, outdated models we currently use around evaluation and measurement. From your experience, um, what what are some of the things we can do to probably better uh, provide some determinants of value to the business of the L&D function? Well, the, you know, I, I do talk about outdated models, and and but it, and that includes Abby and and you know myths we're following, like learning styles and generations and whatever stuff. But one of the things people really want to criticize is Kirkpatrick, and I don't because you know. The problem is he labeled it wrong, and he focused mo only on formal learning, which is wrong. But what he did was right, was said we should start with a measurable business change. We need. Do we need to increase sales? Do we need to decrease time to solve a customer's problem? Do we need to reduce the number of errors in our manufacturing? Whatever it is, there are the business units have measures they're using to track their performance. And that's what we should be using to measure our impact. And then you move from level four, which is that measure, to level three. Well, what would it look like if we were doing the things that would move that needle in the proper way? We would be doing this sort of behavior in the workplace instead of that. Okay, how, that's level three. Let's look to see if people are doing that. Then level two, what sort of training and performance support should we put in place so that this different behavior is happening in the workplace? That's level two. And then level one, you know, what do people think about it? I don't really give a stuff about level one because by and large learners have no idea of what's really working for them. They only know what they like and the correlation between what they like and what actually works is relatively zero. It's not negative, but it's essentially zero. So you want to see if people can do what you they need to be able to do. And then you want to see if they're doing it in the workplace. And then you want to see if it's having the impact on the business metric. And if you you know, you work backwards from four to two, implement two, ver verify it's happened, three is happening, and then hit four, and you can take credit for four. Yep. But it's that chain you need of evidence, but it's starting with business metrics. It's not time and seat. It's are we making the sales we need to make? Are we reducing the time for a sale? Um, uh Are we increasing their ability to do X? Do we decrease the time it takes to solve customer problems, and ultimately, what's our customer satisfaction? Uh, people like Dave Gray and his Connected Company book talk about what companies need to be measuring going forward, and at the core, it's, are we creating a killer customer experience? And that's, you know. Yep, that, that's right, that's true. And thanks for, for, for touching on those aspects, and you're right. I think, I think people are, are quick to sort of bury Kirkpatrick in the model, but I really believe there is still value for it if you approach it in the way you, you outline there, that systemic approach. Further to that, we just break level one and two. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Stopping there, or just level one, you're, you're wasting exactly. your time. Exactly so, right. Sorry. Yeah, right. that's right. No, that's okay. So I was going to sort of take the conversation a bit to uh, a different sort of direction around the, the social learning. And, uh, you know, we know yourself and people like Jane and others around the world uh, are very keen on the social learning aspect and especially via the, the various chats that you have, but also, you know, the working out loud approach and show your work and, and those sort of things. So what do you, what do you think is the, the future for the social learning phenomenon? Is, is it one that's going to increase, blossom to something bigger and better, or are we at a, at a point where it's now plateaued and we are seeing the best of the best of social learning and that's where what we've got to do, and that's what we've got, that's what we're going to have to live with? Well, you know, so I want to be clear, and, and there's two James. There's Jane Hart and Jane Bozarth, and both of them have valuable things to say about this social learning. Uh, they call themselves the evil James, but we don't need to go there. Um, and, um, but we naturally socially learn. I mean, that's been essentially part of the essence of being human. So we've always socially learned, whether it's around the water cooler or it's around a task we're focusing on. Um, 
So what we now have is social media that allows us to break down the barriers, uh, the tyranny of time and space, and let us really get working on, together on this. Now, the things we have learned over time about what makes social learning work better, um, both for learning and, you know, let me take a, a, a sidestep here and say, you know, I no longer think it's just about learning. We are worried about performance, and so half the picture is the ability to optimally execute. So that's where formal learning happens to give it and performance support. But the other half is continual innovation, and I will suggest that the only sustainable differentiator going forward for organizations is the ability to continually innovate. And innovation happens by creative friction between people. So social learning is critical for business success on forward. So we have uh, two things. Um, that we need to be concerned with. One is facilitating learning through social mechanisms. There's real power to be found there, and, and it's not just formal, although there's power in formal, but mentoring and coaching sort of cross the boundary between formal and informal, but also collaboration and cooperation and um, the ability to answer questions and help people is sort of the cooperation part, and then the collaboration where we're working together to solve a problem that's social learning at its really ultimate, and this is an area that is going to start taking learning and development into a bigger picture because it's more than just skills, it's also culture, and you have to get the culture right for learning to happen. So I think there's a lot of room to grow, a lot of opportunity to be tapped into, and I think L&D has a central role to facilitate innovation and to develop people's ability and to remove friction but also to shape the culture. And that's a big part of where I think L&D is missing an opportunity. Yep, yep, so true, so true. And so w with that in mind, we then moved into uh, sort of talking a bit about other parts of learning. I know you've been also in your book talking about, uh, and I know you're also, I think, a, a signature to the e-learning manifesto. So e-learning has gone to a situation where at the moment we are... Um, we are finding that although here in Australia it's been embraced, there, there hasn't been as much, I suppose, um, new whiz-bang approaches to it. It's pretty much out of what I would call, I call it a stale, a stale level, still, still much, very much the same. With the e-learning manifesto um, coming through, what, what, what is the challenge you're putting out there to, to the e-learning professionals around e-learning itself, given that most of them are probably operating in this this way anyway, what's the additional challenge or what's the step up we're looking for for e-learning professionals to take if we're going to make e-learning something, I suppose, more interactive, exciting, and like you say, delivering on performance? Mm -hmm. um, so a couple elements. I've been putting it into practice recently myself. I just took on a role for the uh, Wadwani Foundation, a, a philanthropy focused on job training in, in developing countries and trying to put in practice the principles. And it's much more than just, you know, doing e-learning better. It's really shifting the focus. So our objectives cannot be about know or understand. Our objectives have to be about do. And when we make that shift, and you can look at Kathy Moore's action mapping or Roger Shank's uh, goal-based scenarios, we see this focus on problems up front that if we, we can solve them, we know that we have the ability to solve the problems we're going to face out in the world. So we need to put problems focused. And there now is evidence that problem-based learning actually trumps uh, traditional instruction in the form, in a, not just to pass a test right away, later on it's better, and it leads to more appropriate transfer. And so we need to start shifting our learning design to put practice up front. We have to have meaningful practice where Realistic contexts, um, uh, the real decisions we need and consequences of those decisions embodied in a, in a place that drive people to the content. Instead of trying to dump content on them first, give them a meaningful, realistic task, have them solve that. And then, you know, in solving it, they've got to go learn it. If you choose this right, they won't be able to solve it until they've learned the knowledge they need to be you know, that you think is the focus, but it's that shift and focus on practice, sufficient practice, meaningful practice, make it en en engaging, and then resource with the minimum amount of information to get them successful in that practice instead of dumping everything on them and then just testing their knowledge. It's that shift. 
to real contextualized performance, sufficient quantity thereof, versus information dump and knowledge test. That's the at the core of the shift in my mind. Yep, yep. Okay, so we're coming towards the end now, Clark. So I just want to sort of give you an opportunity to talk a bit more about what are some of the key aspects of of the book and what, what is it that you're looking to achieve via the book? As in, what, what's the, if it was one clear message you want to get out there to the LD profession, what would it be via this medium? Uh, so my claim, you know, the, the starting point is, in a sense, is that L&D isn't doing near what it could and should be doing, and what it is doing, it's doing bad. So we're doing formal training as the only tool in our repertoire, and we're not we're doing it badly. We're not doing an informed pedagogy. But the the shift I want to make is to start looking at the bigger picture. Don't use the, the the real ultimate shift is start with the network. If the answer can be in the network, you're done. We have you know nobody's saying that they have way too much time to build courses. <laughs> Instead, try and put the emphasis on the network. Do performance support as your second stop. Don't try and put information in the world, not in the head. It's really hard. That whole point about the series of learning manifesto is it's hard to get stuff in the head, particularly abstract arbitrary information. So try and put that in the world. And then develop courses only as the last resort when it absolutely positively has to be in the head and focus on meaningful decisions. That's the shift. So there's social learning performance support and formal learning done right as all the things we can and should be doing. Underneath that is infrastructure, using technology in ways that really facilitate us so the tools are to hand. We don't have to go over here for this and over that. The second underpinning is strategy because we're not there yet and different organizations are going to have different needs of where to focus first. And the final one, as I mentioned before, is culture. We've got to start living a culture of sharing and ex quick experimentation and learning from mistakes and, and being open, the show your work type of stuff that Jane Bozart talks about, or, um, you know, work out loud that, uh, as Harold Jarkey calls it, we've got to live the culture, demonstrate the culture and create that culture change for all this to really be able to take optimum, uh, foothold and traction and essential and ultimately outcomes. So that's my core message is stop doing just training, look at the full picture, get all the elements aligned to be make meaningful impacts on the organization. And what a great message that is, Clark, to finish on. That's really, really good because one of the things that I'm also working on here in, uh, in Australia is about, about performance consultancy, which is about what um, what Don Taylor talks about is moving out of the training ghetto and out of that solution hearing and into more about stop, you know, why do you need this? Uh, what is it you're trying to solve? What is the actual issue? Rather than saying, I need leadership training, I need performance management training, uh, we need systems training. It's un unpacking it more, understanding what the actual real problem is. So you're, you're right, it's thinking before we jump to a solution, why, what is it we're trying to do? What is the uh, we're trying to solve? So a very good message for us. So again, once again, everyone, Check out Clark's book. It's a really good book. Like I said, I'm halfway through it. I'm really enjoying it. Um, Clark says it as it is, to be honest. So if you, yeah, if you want it in your face and you want to read it up front, Clark tells it as it is, which is really good. So he's not pulling any punches. Uh, what I liked about this is very refreshingly honest and upfront, and actually does challenge you to start thinking about Alan Dean a different way. So thanks very much, Clark. Thank you for joining thanks. us all the way from the, the States. And um, hopefully we'll get to talk to you again sometime in the future. So what we'll do is we'll have the Oslo chat, Clark, and I'll send you a link to our LinkedIn group where you can see the, the story file from the tweet chat. And if uh, people got any further questions or, or topics I want to discuss, you might be able to sort of uh, add a post to the LinkedIn group or whatever suits you. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay. And I wish you all uh, good luck. I hope you can uh, join. I hope you'll join the revolution. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Clark. Take care.